ready. What's the temperature like up where your house is? <laughs> what is it? What do you reckon the temperature is up there? If the temperature is about minus five. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for Hi. coming, and thanks to those of you watching online. I'm Summer Bias. I'm the curator here at the museum. Um, so I have just a couple announcements before we get started. But first, everyone take a second to um, just turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, so by now you may have heard of our new scavenger hunt, which is called Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem. Um, the last day it'll be on sale is next Thursday, the 25th, before 4 p.m. So if you're interested in picking one up, contact Thea Seagraves, and if you need her contact information, um, her card is at the bar. Um, and also we finally have a proposed installation date for our new permanent exhibits. And so that is March 15th. So keep your eyes open for um, updates about the grand reopening. And then for March, our upcoming programs, um, our brown bag lunch on the 3rd will be with Mary Duffy from the Amelia Island Sea Turtle Watch. She's going to be talking about what her organization does and the upcoming sea turtle nesting season. And then our third on third on March 19th, will be the opening of our new temporary exhibit um, entitled Glitz, Glamour, and Growth, Swinging into the 1920s. The exhibit was curated by local high school students as part of our annual student exhibit program. We will also be joined by staff members from Norman Studios, um, a historic film studio in Jacksonville, for a panel discussion about film in Florida during the 1920s. So this should be really fun, and I hope you all come out to see that. Uh, that's a little program for next month, but tonight we have Shannon browning Mullis. Shannon browning Mullis works to bring the history of oppressed people to the public through architecture, artifacts, and personal stories in an effort to move towards justice today. As curator of history and decorative arts for Telfair Museums, she led the major reinterpretation of the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters, which resulted in the full inclusion of the enslaved men, women, and children into the site's narrative. She is currently the executive director of the Juliet Gordon Lowe Birthplace, where she seeks to use history to empower women and girls. So everyone, please welcome Shannon browning Mullis. Thank you. I'm going to take this off of because um, <laughs> I'm not loud enough even without it on, and so if I had it on, you wouldn't know. Um, Y'all are the first people I've spoken to in real live person in a year. Um, I mean, you know, in a formal setting. Inside my house, I talk all the time. Um, but I'm really happy to be here with you and so glad that you came out even on a little bit of a nasty night with yeah. rain, so thanks so much. And do forgive me if I peek at my phone. I'm just making sure that I haven't kept you here for two hours. <laughs> I'm not looking for calls. So I'm going to talk a little bit about house museums um, and then about the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters specifically. And then, of course, I have to mention the site I'm at today. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future of museums. Um, but there are just a few of us here, so I think we can be really informal. And if you have questions or comments, you know, just just say so. We don't even have to wait till the end. We can just kind of talk it through. <clears throat> so I wanted to, I think a lot about historic house museums. They're so different. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many of them in this country. And they've had an interesting trajectory that I think a lot about. Um, and of course, it's not universal. They're all different. But generally speaking, a lot of these museums opened between the 1950s and the 1970s. They really saw their peak uh, around the bicentennial of the country in 1976. And they were often um, purchased and designed by societies of wealthy white women. So people mm -hmm. like the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, or the Colonial Dames are really the genesis of a lot of these places. Now, we have to thank them for that because they very likely wouldn't have been preserved. They would have been broken up into apartments or, or you know other things if they even still existed. But for the most part, the colonial dames are not historians or curators. 
so when these sites opened, they were fun. They were interior decorating projects that people were really <laughs> passionate about. Um, but they mostly told the stories of white American elites. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the other distinction that I want to point out that you'll see in historic house museums is that there are historic house museums that were lived in by people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And then there are historic house museums that were lived in by people who were really important in their community at their time, but not so much you know, on the national stage. And so it's, it's a little bit different. So after 1976, I would say that scholarship largely increased. Uh, there was a lot more historic rigor and thought. And museum practices you know, also got better. And professionals started to work in these sites. But you still saw a pretty dramatic decrease in visitorship from 1976 until very recently. And between 2008 and 2012, uh, visitorship to most historic house museums dropped by about 20%. Which I think is a pretty, you know, dire statistic. So a lot of those museums have closed. But my question to you is why? Why is there this lack of interest in these sites, and why is visitorship declining? There are a lot of reasons. It's specific to different sites, but I would posit that one of the main reasons is because they're not relevant to people's lives. People don't see themselves reflected in these spaces. People aren't really looking to identify with wealthy white people of the past who are so different from what all of our lives are like today. So for museums to survive, house museums particularly, they have to become relevant to people and to people's everyday lives. <clears throat> so a lot of museums today know that, uh, and they're changing what they do, they're changing the way they tell their stories, and they're changing the stories they tell. So I want to look particularly at the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters in Savannah, Georgia, uh, which I worked at for almost eight years until December 14th, so very, very recently. Uh, so I want to talk about the project to reinterpret this site and tell you a little bit about it. So this is William J. Do I have a pointer? Do I have a pointer? I don't think so. Okay. Oh, okay. This is William J. Um, he was a young English architect. He came to Savannah. He was the first academically trained architect ever to work in Savannah. Um, all before he'd been master builders, you know, craftsmen, but not actually architects. And he designed, this is the first house he designed. It's an English Regency style villa. It's what you would see in England. Uh, very different from what you were seeing in Savannah before that, which was mostly Federalist style homes. Um, if you're familiar with the Davenport House a block away, that's mostly what larger homes look like in the area. Yes. Well, which of the two are you talking about? This is the front and this is the back. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yep. Those two different houses. Yeah. <laughs> um, good point. Uh, <laughs> so he designed a number of houses in Savannah, also some commercial buildings, and then went to Charleston for a minute and went on back to England. But this house made an impression. Um, has everybody been to Savannah? Oh, yeah. Has anybody yeah. else been there? Okay, so you're familiar with the historic district and the squares and how it's a little bit different from most cities. Um, it's built on a city plan. The way the city plan works is that you have a square, which was a central gathering place used for a variety of things. And on the north and south sides, 10 lots each were called tithing lots. And those were intended for private dwellings for people's houses. On the east and west sides, two lots on each side were much larger, and they were intended for public structures, for your ch churches and your courthouses and your town halls. Uh, but when Savannah was originally founded, there were four squares. So, you know, that's a pretty small number of trust lots. And, of course, the city grew steadily until I believe the maximum it ever had was six squ uh, 26 squares. But what that means is you really don't need that many churches and courthouses, <laughs> and halls, even in the deep south. Um, so wealthy people started to buy those larger lots to put these big houses on. So the physical nature of most of these sites at that time, mansion on the front, slave quarters and carriage house in the back, with a walled workyard in between those two spaces. Now today, some of these large houses still exist, some of the outbuildings still exist, but usually, even if that's true, the space in between has been filled in with townhouses. So you don't see what the nature of the footprint of the space would have been like at the time. 
this is a spot where you can still see what that was like. Although I will say the walled garden now is a formal garden. It would not have been a formal garden at that time. There would have been folks out there hanging laundry and taking care of chickens and any number of other things. So that is quite a bit different. <clears throat> so this is the back of the house you just saw. Hmm. This is the carriage house. Mm -hmm. This side. Thank you. I'll try not to smack the television. <laughs> uh, this side of that building was the slave quarters. So if you were standing right here, this is the view you would see. So this was the slave quarters. This is the carriage house. So the back of that side. And this walled area here, formal garden today, but a workyard at that time. Mm. Now, I do want to make a, a note because it comes up a lot, and I want to be clear and sensitive about this. When we talk about people, um, we don't use the term slave anymore. We use the term enslaved men, women, children, whoever, uh, because it's a temporary condition that people were placed in. It's not who those people were. But you will he hear me say slave quarters. And the reason is because if I say enslaved quarters, it implies that the building was enslaved, okay. which is not true. Uh, and historically, that's what it would have been called. So until I come up with or hear somebody else come up with a better term, that's, that's the one I'm going with. So these are the folks who own this house. First guy, this is not really him. His portrait is out there somewhere labeled anonymous Southern gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> but that's Richard Richardson. <clears throat> he was a shipping merchant. He was a bank president. And he was a domestic slave trader. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. The next man that you see there is George Welshman Owens. Um, he owned eight plantations. He enslaved about 400 individuals on those plantations. He was mm. a politician. He was the mayor of Savannah at one time. This is his daughter. Her name was Maggie Owens. She married Dr. James Gray Thomas, so they owned the house mm. after that. And their daughter, Margaret Gray Thomas, inherited it last. She passed away in 1951, and at oh, that wow. time she willed it to Telfair Museum oh, okay. to wow. be opened as a historic house museum. So this is the first house museum to open in the city of Savannah. It opened in 1954 after a few years of restoration. Mm. Now, have any of you, unless you heard it at Louis Thomas House, ever heard of any of these people? Mm. So it makes it a very different thing, a different visitor experience than if you were at Mount Vernon or Monticello, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When people go to those spaces, they go, I want to hear about George Washington, <laughs> right? But if people are on vacation to Savannah, they're not like, I want to hear about George Owens. They, they want to hear about history, and they want to learn about what life was like. That's why they're there. So museum opened in 1954, and like I mentioned, it was largely the project of wealthy white women who were very well-meaning but not studied in history. <laughs> and so this house was built, in, it completed in 1819. But they put in what you see here is a colonial kitchen. This house didn't exist during the colonial period. Uh, so that is interesting. The other thing that's interesting is this is a view from the back porch of the house looking at the carriage house and slave quarters. And what they had done, uh, the family, you know, they owned it until the 1950s. So obviously nobody lived in the slave quarters and there are no horses in the carriage house. They turned these into a townhouse apartments. Oh, really? So when the museum inherited this building, that's what it was. They kept the tenants in place and used that money to help fund the museum. 1990 rolled around. The tenants moved out. I was not there, so I don't know whether the museum asked them to move out or they just happened to move out. Uh, but either way, they said, you know, this is an old building, but it's been redone multiple times. Nothing original is left. We're going to put offices out here. So they got in there and they started pulling down drop plaster ceilings and plaster okay. walls. Mm -hmm. And what they found is original fireplaces, mm -hmm. original ceilings, original sections of the floor. And they said, whoa, let's stop and figure out what to do next. Um, and, and to their credit, they restored it to the way it had been originally preserved as much as they could, but realized in the early 90s that they had no idea how to tell this story. Mm -hmm. It's not a story that was being told a whole lot, and they were not a diverse staff trying to tell it. 
So, I'm going to drink a little bit. <laughs> They set about rounding up a group of scholars that could help them figure out how to tell this story. In 2011, they held this um, <clears throat> Slavery and Freedom in Savannah Symposium that brought historians from all over the country to investigate what slavery and freedom were like in the city of Savannah during the time that folks lived in this house. Uh, the editor it ended up being a book published by University of Georgia Press, which came out in 2014. And uh, the editors were uh, Dr. Leslie Harris and Dr. Ramey Berry, Di Dana Ramey Berry, sorry. Uh, and you frequently see both of them on GPB and other places talking about all these types of issues. They're really fantastic historians. So they really dug deep. I think there were 10 or so historians uh, participating in this project. So a lot of stories came out of this. A lot of stories <clears throat> you'll hear me talk about, we know about from their research. Y'all know John Bryant? He lives here among you. Um, he was one of the scholars involved in this project. So another big part of this is uh, most historic house museums, this one included, you experience by guided tour, and you really have to prepare tour guides to tell complicated, difficult stories. So we shifted from a part-time and some volunteer staff to a full-time paid staff, mostly of people with uh, at least bachelor's, but often master's degrees in history or related subject. It means we have decently high turnover because you get them right out of school and they're fantastic and they move on to something else. But they do their time and we appreciate it. Um, the other things that we do are put them through uh, training through the National Association of Interpretation, which really teaches about um, tour giving, how to relate to an audience and that kind of thing. And we do spe special training on uh, interpreting difficult history. Because, let's face it, I think we all know our country has not healed from the experience of enslavement and the oppression that grew out of that is not over. Uh, and so when you talk with people about that, no matter who those people are, they have specific feelings about it. And if you have a group of 16 random tourists who have come in, they may have all very different feelings about it, and you're trying to reach everybody where they are, bring them along with you, and it, it's a challenge. So it's a big job that we ask of these people. You'll notice, now these pictures were taken three or four years ago, um, but you notice there there is not a lot of diversity in these. We still struggle throughout the museum field to increase diversity. Um, there's work going on there, but it is not a, a problem solved by any means. So in November 2018, we had installed all new exhibits. So what you'll see now, how many people have been? Have you, have you seen it? Yeah, awesome. Um, so what you see now is uh, you start off in what was originally the carriage house, and you have an orientation gallery. And what it really tries to do is situate you in time and space to help you understand how the house fits into the larger history, how it fits into the city. And then you go from there into the slave quarters, uh, where you get a sense of what it was like for the folks who lived there. And then you go from there uh, to the two upper floors of the house, which are a traditional historic house museum in uh, interpretation. But you hear the stories about people who lived and worked in those spaces and how they interacted on a daily basis. And then you end in the basement, where there are a lot of interactive exhibits, and it's an opportunity for you to more deeply explore the stories that really stood out to you on the guided tour. So we had this event in, in November of 2018 to you know, really recognize the opening and the change and invite the community out for food and fellowship and music. And do not tell my daughter or my husband but this may have been the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there were people in, in the community who you would never normally see spending time together, who had never seen each other before, even if they were both born and raised in Savannah, sitting at a table eating food together. Mm. And there were conversations. <clears throat> God, I'm so sorry. I should have drank more water. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> there were conversations happening. <clears throat> that you don't normally hear from people who have just met each other. So it's a really exciting experience. So why is it important to tell these stories? Well, there are a few reasons. Most obviously, 
we tell people that we teach about history. But if we're only teaching about part of the history, we're teaching a myth. We're not teaching history. You see the census here. <clears throat> 1840, there were nine free white persons and 14 slaves. If you're telling the story of the nine people and not the 14, you haven't told the story. So that's something that we desperately want people to recognize. It's not the other part of the story. It's not another story. It's an integral piece of the story we've always been telling. So were the nine, nine white people all living in that particular house? Yes. So they were all interrelated? Mm -hmm. Most of them were children. Okay. Yeah, they had six children. Okay. So Owens uh, and his wife, their six children, actually it would have been the five youngest children, and then their oldest son, <clears throat> he's a whole story in himself, uh, <laughs> they ended up raising his children. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a talk about him. So I just want to turn a little bit to um, some of the specific stories that are told at the house. <coughs> um, so you can get a sense of like when you're down in the basement and you can really engage further in those stories, the kinds of things you can learn about. So when I started at the house, uh, it was at the point where a lot of this research was still happening. We didn't know everything yet. Uh, we knew that Richard Richardson was a shipping merchant. He sold lots of things. Um, you know, he, he sold cotton. He sold whatever else you sell. Madeira, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and we knew that he had been somewhat involved in the domestic slave trade. What we didn't know is whether at some point he took advantage of some situation and mm. so participated in like one or two exchanges or whether this was a major part of what he did in his in his professional life. But this is a shipping manifest. <clears throat> and during my research, I found quite a lot of these shipping manifests. And if you look right here, you will see R. Richardson, Savannah. These are people's names. These are their sexes, <clears throat> their ages, their heights. And it says their class, and, and what they're really talking about is uh, folks' complexion. So the other thing that you will see is where these people are going. Pensacola and New Orleans. Hmm. I found enough of these to show us that he sold at least 200 human beings from the port of Savannah mm -hmm. to be shipped to New Orleans and Pensacola, mostly New Orleans. Now this is, <clears throat> I don't see the exact date on this one, but uh, this is between you know, 1815 and 1825 probably. Um, the international slave trade became illegal in 1808, so it's illegal to bring, to kidnap people and bring them into the United States. It's not illegal to sell people amongst the states. So what you see is an increase of westward expansion, an increase in agriculture going west, and a decrease in the number of people held in bondage in the northeast and in, in the mid-south where agriculture is kind of waning. So people, you've read, if you've read much about this, you hear about people being sold away down south, right? Uh, it's people from Virginia, people from those places in that area being sold down, often separated from their families, um, and that's what Richardson's doing. That's what he's participating in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These folks are 30, 50, and 26. That's three of them. But then they're eight, five, six, five, mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. two, two. Mm -hmm. The majority of people that he sent to New Orleans mm -hmm. were under 12 years old. And I can tell you from the numbers and the way they break down that they were not traveling in family units. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this the jail? Mm -hmm. I hope I'm telling y'all everything. I haven't looked at my notes in a few seconds. Can I ask a quick another question? Sure. 
Um, apart from the um, nine white members at, mm -hmm. at the home, were there, did you say there were 16? There were 14, 14. that 14 year. And mm -hmm. were they all family related or were they all? Mm -mm. So let me talk a little bit about that because I think it's so important. Um, what you'll see, and I will say that was in 1840. So if you looked in 1835 or 1845, you know, it's going to always be slightly different. People are coming and going. Here's what you find. For people like George Owen specifically, who uh, enslaved a lot of people on rural agricultural land, the people who are in this urban property are not permanent. So what you may have is, uh, like, let's say kids who aren't strong enough yet to really be useful in a field brought to town where they can run errands and, and do small tasks. Or uh, the cook, for example, would probably be highly skilled and would travel with the family to cook wherever they were. Uh, same with the enslaved nursemaid. She's going wherever those children are. But there could be somebody working in the house um, that displeased Owens. He sends them back out and work in the fields and brings somebody else to do that job. So it's going to vary all the time. Um, and often people's families are actually, if they are still being held by the same person, they may be out on the plantation somewhere. So I want to talk a little bit about punishment. Um, so there was a city jail located in Lafayette Ward from 1801 to 1845. And uh, the things we're going to talk about happened in that building. This is the next iteration of the jail, but it's the earliest one we have an image of. So I'm sharing it for your entertainment, but it's not actually the building where this happened. Um, so you hear a lot, you know, a lot of our uh, knowledge of enslavement comes from books and movies and, you know, fiction. And often what is fictional, fictionalized is rural agricultural life. It's plantations, right? But people were enslaved in urban environments as well, which is why we talk about it at this urban house. And their lives tended to be a good bit different. Not better, um, but different than people who are working in the fields. And one way is that you hear a lot about um, the physical abuse that people experienced in rural areas, people being beaten by overseers and things like that. And I'm certain that those things happen inside houses in urban areas. But the other thing that we know happened is that people were sent to the jail where jailers were paid to punish people. That's not something I knew about before this research started. Um, <clears throat> so people were sent there either for safekeeping, which meant they were just locked up, or, you know, they were actually paying for physical abuse. So I want to read um, the account of a man named William Grimes. He was enslaved in Savannah. He later escaped enslavement and wrote his own uh, autobiography. So it's his words about his own experiences. Now, I will say they are... They are difficult, so um, this is his experience in the Savannah jail. He said, I will state that I have seen women brought there and tied hand and foot and their clothes turned up and tied there, up to their shoulders, leaving their body perfectly naked, then whipped with keen rawhide or cow skin sometimes called until the blood run down their heels. I was then in expectation that it would be my turn next, every moment looking for it. While I was in confinement, I myself, as well as the other prisoners, were used to the sound, Oh, pray, oh, pray, which came from those poor slaves, then in preparation for being whipped. Or experiencing them at the same time, the smart of the lash, which was so often used without mercy. <clears throat> I'm going to spare you the rest, but it, it goes on in much the same way, and he talks about the fact that enslaved people were forced to... Uh, met out these physical punishments on other enslaved people at risk of further punishment themselves if they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're looking at here is a torture chamber. Mm. Richard Richardson, who we started out with, uh, jailed people for safekeeping or for punishment. We know one of them was named William. 
He was jailed for 30 days in 1813, and Lucy, who was held for 10 days in 1814. Between 1814 and 1863, George Owens, or his sons, jailed 18 enslaved men and women, some for safekeeping, others for running away. One man named Osborne was jailed for 34 days for lunacy. We're going to revisit this a little bit later and, and talk about a particular person and their experience, but I just want to put something out for you to think about um, that's, that's a hard truth. This is early days of the folks of color in this setting's experience with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a legacy that is problematic to this day. Mm -hmm. This is, these pictures are not of Emma Catton because we don't have a picture of Emma Catton, but she was a nursemaid for the Owens children. Mm. Now, the experiences of enslaved nannies which is a modern term that didn't say nanny, they said nursemaid, they're so complicated. Um, and they're one that I think people really want to latch onto because they want it to be a benevolent, loving relationship. And they think if there is one, this is the one, right? Um, and I think it's complicated. I certainly think those babies <coughs> love those women, right? Because that's just the nature of caregiving. Um, but those women were enslaved, and they were held in oppression. And so it's an immensely complicated situation. But one of the benefits for us today of that is that these women were mentioned much more often in letters, so we know more about them than we know about somebody working in the field, for example. Can I take you up on that water now? Because I drank. <laughs> Thank you. There's always wine. Yeah. Yes, but I have to drive two and a half hours. Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, and I will be asleep. Um, yeah. So I want to share a little bit um, out of some of these letters. Thank you. About Emma. Um, and, and I want to get a little bit at how the Owens talked about feeling about Emma, but how they treated her when it came down to it, right? So um, a niece of the Owens in 1834 included in one of her letters, give my love to Brother Dick and Sister Mary, John and George, Cousin Ben and Tom, and all the folks, to Emma and Mom Kate, I wish you could, I could see you all. So she's including Emma in her greetings. We also see uh, in 1835, George Owens writes to his wife Sarah, he's not in town, he says he hates to hear that Emma is so sick, but he thinks if she's careful with her youth, she'll surmount the disease. The prospect of consumption is dreadful. Um, he writes again a few months later, and he says, As Emma is unwell, I do not know, but it would be as well to bring her with you, leaving her children, so that she may procure medical advice in Philadelphia. I doubt very much if Warren, who is a local Savannah doctor, is acquainted with her disease. If she comes, you will, of course, leave Kate. Mm. So he's having her brought to Philadelphia to receive medical treatment. It's not something that most people could afford. Mm -hmm. You know, it's theoretically a sign of, of caring in some way. After that, we go down the timeline. Uh, George Owens leaves <clears throat> $100 to Emma in his will. And his son, John Wallace, uh, leaves this whole crazy thing in his will about um, keeping Emma and her children in the possession of his family line, whether it's him or his children. And then he goes down the line of his sisters, and if something happens to this sister, then it's this sister, and they're not under the control of the sister's husbands. And then he gives her $100. Now, in neither of those wills did they say, oh, yeah, we give her, her freedom that she might live out her life as she sees fit. So, you know, you have a mixed bag with those letters. You think, well, okay, so there's some caring there. What's really happening? Then we found uh, the jail register for 
January 30th, 1860. Emma was in her 60s. This is the same jail William Grimes has just described to us. And the estate of George Marshall Owens, meaning his sons, puts Emma in jail and pays $1.50 for them to keep her there. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Uh, there's no indication in any notes of, of what led to that moment. But I can tell you this. You can say that somebody is like family all you want to, but George Owens would have never put his sisters or his daughters in that jail. Mm -hmm. I'll also point out that she raised these children, and so she would have slept in their room, very likely, on a pallet on the floor in their room. Um, her children, and we know she did have at least a daughter named Harriet, um, would not have been in that room. So whether Harriet was being raised by other enslaved women in the slave quarters, right behind the house, and she saw her mother pretty much every day, or whether she was off on a plantation somewhere and saw her maybe once a year, we just we just don't know. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, family, which um, we were talking a little bit about earlier whether families are together or whether they're not together. And I want to read a couple of letters uh, from George Owens. And you'll notice a theme here that I forgot to point out. Uh, one of the things that, that I thought was really important when we reinterpreted this space was to use primary documents, but to read more deeply into them to, to kind of what's not being said um, and, and to get at what was happening in the words of the people who were there, although we recognize that it's only half the people who were there who we have writings from, right? So George Owen uh, writes to his wife, Sarah. He's in Paris. He writes back to her in Savannah in 1818, and he says, I'm engaged in speculation for the purchase of Johnston's Negroes, but fear I shall not succeed. If not, and they are sold, you will buy Smart's wife and Sampson's to comply with the promise I made them. If there is any other prime Negro man also with any wife, purchase for him also. If you have not enough money, you can obtain it at the bank, and Mr. Anderson will endorse it for you. <clears throat> he says uh, a few months later, I have failed in the purchase of the Osobal. Osobal is the island where these folks were being held. Uh, also about Negroes, the price being asked was too high. They will be sold in February or March next, as I am informed. And if I should not be there at the time, though I trust I shall, you must contrive to purchase those, say three or four, who were connected with our Negroes. It will be understood that they are prime. The proceeds of the crop will enable you to do this. What word stands out? Crop. Other than the one that makes everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. Did you note the word prime? prime. Okay. What does prime mean? Mm -hmm. It means a couple things. The one we always think of is strong and mm -hmm. able to do a lot of labor. It absolutely does mean that. But in this case, it means something more important than that. It means fertile. Yeah. Enslaved babies, enslaved children, Follow the status and ownership of their mothers. Mm -hmm. He didn't say to buy husbands mm -hmm. for the women they enslaved. Mm -hmm. He said to buy the wives. Mm -hmm. Because when those women had children, it increased the population of people he enslaved. Mm -hmm. And it, he said in both letters, it be understood that they are prime, that these women can bear children. Mm -hmm. So I think when we see things, we have to look really closely at what it is that's actually happening. Let's see. Do we want to hear one more? Should we skip one? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to skip this one um, because I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is happening now. So this project, you know, opened a few years ago now. Um, What's going to happen next at this site? Well, one of the questions that I struggled with the entire time was, how does the story end? Because it doesn't. You know, it, the story didn't end in 1865 with the Civil War. It didn't end with the Civil Rights Movement. It's not over now. But 
when you have people at Historic House Museum for 45 minutes, you have to end the story somewhere. You can't hold hostage. Um, and uh -huh. so the compromise was, okay, we're going to talk about the time up to 1840, because we're going to talk about the 1820s, 1830s. That's what we're going to talk about. But we're going to launch the Legacy of Slavery in Savannah Initiative. We're going to invite a whole new group of scholars to town to say, how are these legacies still affecting our communities today? What problems still need to be solved? How are people still being oppressed? So that's happening. Uh, doctors Talitha LaFloria and Melissa Cooper are leading that effort. They're brilliant. They've got an all-star cast of scholars doing that research. Uh, and if you're interested in this initiative, you can go to telfair.org slash LOS for Legacy of Slavery. And you can see all the events associated with it and all the work that's going into that. But in December, uh, I left and took over as executive director of the Juliet Gordon Miller Birthplace, which is about a block and a half away from the Owens Thomas house. So I didn't really change neighborhoods too much. We started out talking about um, house museums. And so we've really talked in depth about one house museum and how it shifted its narrative and the direction I'm hoping it goes. So I want to mention this one because, you know, I'm there now and I'm doing all the fun stuff like taking over in the middle of a construction project and in a pandemic and you know trying to figure out how to get it open back up. Um, but one of the things I think is so powerful about this space is it's an opportunity to empower women and girls. Um, those are the stories that we're trying to tell there and the things we're trying to bring to light. Um, and one of the things that I think is extremely dangerous that I'm trying very hard to pull us away from is uh, the deification of historical figures. They're human beings. None of them were perfect. And if you look hard enough, you will find horrible things about every single one of them. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for us to say, Juliet Gordon Lowe, who founded the Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. um, and, and whose home this is, you know, did a great thing for women and girls. She wasn't perfect. <laughs> um, but you know, what can you do, even though you're not perfect? that's going to further humanity, that's going to make the world more just. Um, and so we are working to tell those stories and to discover more stories and more nuance to help you know, bring girls and other vis visitors into the future. <coughs> so I'm going to just say a couple of things about um, things that museums are doing to remain relevant. We talked a little bit about at the beginning about whether historic house museums are becoming irrelevant. One thing is creative programming. This, I think, is so cool. Uh, these images are from Historic House Museums in New Orleans. Uh, it's the Herman Grimma and Gallagher houses. And they did this amazing program before COVID. And what it was is this interactive play. So they had a local theater company come in. And um, this, it was a real thing that had happened um, where an enslaved woman was accused of something and she ran away. And what they did is they took the events of that evening and reenacted them, but they reenacted them throughout the whole site. And people, mm -hmm. the visitors, could stay in one room through the whole thing. And if they did, they would only find out what happened in that room. Uh, mm -hmm. Or they could follow one actor and they would see what happened to that actor the whole time. But it ran on a loop. So the first time you could go through it and think you knew what really happened. But then if you followed a different character the next time, next time you realize you didn't know what really happened because you missed all these other things. Just like in life, when you get one side of the story, you miss all these other things that are happening. So I think really creative programming like that engages people and makes people want to come out and be part of it. The other thing that's so important is that people are, are recognizing that, as you can see, museums are not neutral. Uh, this woman, her name is LaTanya Altry. She's a brilliant scholar. Uh, follow her. And, and she talks a lot about museums and how neutrality is, is really a myth. If you are neutral in the face of injustice, then you're siding with the oppressor. Who is that? Desmond Tutu said that, right? Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely true. It's true for people. It's true for museums. You have organizations like the International Coalition of Sites of Conscious who are working with historic sites all over the world to talk about uh, all kinds of things and talk about how historic sites can work to make the world a more equitable and just place. 
And you have places uh, like, you know, AAM, the American Alliance of Museums, which is the biggest museum organization in the country, saying, you know, what is the future of museums? And largely, I can tell you, the future of museums that are going to thrive are community-based. They're there to serve the community, and they're there to share authority with the community, to say, here's what we know, what do you know? Let's create something together in this space that was intended for you. So I'm excited to be a museum professional at the moment that you can do that and engage with folks and see what they need and how we can be of service. And that's the direction I hope all museums are going. So can I I'll be happy to answer any questions if people have them. What was the letter about that you skipped earlier? <laughs> there were two of them. I didn't want to keep y'all forever, but if you want to hear them, I'll be happy to share. Um, so one of them is uh, George. So George Owens, I told you, was a politician. He uh, campaigning was different uh, in 1832 than it is today, and so he literally went on a horse to all these little backwoods villages and went to the local pub and said, hey guys, you should vote for me. And his letters talking about that, for the most part, are very funny. Because uh, he says, like, people think I'm nuts. And, you know, so it's kind of fun. But this one's not fun. So he stops in Decatur in uh, July of 1832. And at the bottom of his letter, uh, after he's recounted all the other things happening, he says, the night before the last, I stopped with an acquaintance, a man who stands high in our ranks. So this is a wealthy guy. Uh, he had a little Negro girl about the size of Fanny. Fanny was a little girl enslaved at the Owens Thomas house. She called him Papa. His wife, Mama, slept with them. Hmm. She had the impudence to place her at the table at supper. Hmm. They have no children. This is a freak of the husband, not the wife. One sees strange things. We're not sure what's going on there. You can read that a few different ways. Yeah. So the most likely scenario is he has fathered this child with an enslaved woman, and then they have taken this child away from its mother, and his wife is mothering the child. <laughs> that, I think, is the most likely scenario. Mm -hmm. The other thing that could be happening is very unlikely is that this child is not the child of either of them. They've just taken an enslaved child and started treating it like their child. That's less likely given the circumstances. And even less likely is that Mama is an enslaved woman who he's treating like his wife and this is their child. We don't know which of these things mm -hmm. for sure. I think the first one is the most likely just given what we know. But uh, in any case, you can see the attitudes that come with that, and it's an opportunity for us to talk about something that makes everybody uncomfortable, but is absolutely a core part of the horror of enslavement and was completely common, and that's sexual violence. Um, people want to ask, people love to ask, were they good slave owners? <laughs> and after years of hearing that, what I take it to mean is, did they physically abuse these people, yeah. and did they give them adequate food, clothing, and shelter? I think that's what they're really asking, because, of course, there's no good way to enslave another person. Um, what I would say, though, is if there is a person who is never physically abused and who is always given adequate food, clothing, and shelter, they live every day under the threat of separation from their families mm -hmm. and sexual violence. And those things are true even if the person who enslaves them at that moment has no intention of doing those things. They're at the whim of every white man around, especially if the person who enslaved them died. Mm -hmm. You know, their circumstances could change completely, you know, and, and, and they know that, right? Um, the other letter was one that I just share to point out the attitude of his son, George Owens' son. He was in Wales, uh, so in Great Britain. And he's writing back to his sister, and he says he's at a party, and he was asked, does your father own slaves? And he, and he says, yes, a few. And uh, the person who asked him says, poor things, how can you look at them? And he said, with my eyes, I answered and left the spot. 
this impudent question was asked by a young lady who knew I was from Georgia. So mm. it's just that attitude of superiority and entitlement uh, that I think is illuminating in that letter. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, I love, actually I visited the house and actually my most profound moment was back in the slave quarters where you're really starting to to interpret um, that building. But I'm just wondering, do you uh, reach out to uh, do oral histories with people in Savannah who might have a connection with the house, both enslaved and, and not, um, who you might um, be able to bring yeah. into the story? That's a great question. Uh, so we have relationships with the descendants of Richardson and Owens. They're different. We have some, <laughs> some people who are like, you need to tell this story. It happened. My family was part of it. We know the truth. You need to tell it. And we have others who are like, you're not going to tell that. No. <laughs> um, we have not found the descendants of any of the people enslaved here. Um, uh, we're trying. I need to stop saying we. I was there for a long time. They're trying. Um, I will say we put out calls for people who might know anything and asked uh, if anybody could share local histories. But I will say something else. A lot of people have been exploited in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And for a museum that is primarily throughout its history served privileged people, mm -hmm. um, to ask for intimate family knowledge mm -hmm. and history mm -hmm. without something to offer in return and to say, hey, you can trust us with this, mm -hmm. it has to be proven. Mm -hmm. It has to be no. proven that mm -hmm. that's a community institution that is there to serve the entire community and to build trust. And I don't think we're there yet. No. And I think that's part of the legacy of Slavery and Savannah Initiative is to say, hey, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> help us, help us be of service to the community. Mm -hmm. But I, all the answers aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. But I do hope that one day uh, oral histories will be part of it. Mm -hmm. There are oral histories in the Legacy of Slavery in Savannah book. There are oral histories about experiences in Savannah Mm -hmm. They're not about descendants of that house. Okay. We just saw a program on PBS called The Last Song. I don't know if anybody had a chance to see it. It was really quite good. It was three uh, episodes. And it was about the slave uprising in Jamaica. And it was from the point of view of one of the, of the house slaves, etc. But what I found interesting is that there was a caste system around, uh, among the blacks. The mulattoes, you know, the, the slave owners fathered these children. The mulattoes had a class system that they looked down on the purebred, you know, servants and slaves. And they, it was I didn't realize that happened. Well, that's called colorism. Okay. And that's still a thing. Um, people, it's complicated and it's regionally specific okay. in different parts of the world. Yeah. But uh, people are still discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Based on how they look, it, it, across the world, it's more complicated than black and white, right? Okay. And I and I would also say that you, what you will see throughout history is that the way the most powerful people stay the most powerful people is to have the people with the least amount of power fight amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that is also a symptom of that. And that is true. Um, I had my great grandfather was in the lotto. And um, it was more of like if you were of a lighter complexion, <coughs> then you would be treated differently by the white people. They would treat you a little better because you were of a lighter complexion as opposed to if you're darker than, you know. So that is very prevalent in the history and unfortunately still today um and that is something that was learned because if you're a lighter complexion then you're better because white people will treat you better you know and even if you ever notice if you're watching a television program you will see more um lighter Mm -hmm. yeah. African American people, mm -hmm. then yeah. Yeah. the darker people, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and then just hearing stories from my grandmother, who's it was her father who was Milano, mm -hmm. um, she was treated better mm -hmm. growing up because mm -hmm. she was of a lighter complexion. Even my mom and her siblings 
we were treated better because we were of a lighter complexion mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. but it's just yeah. And and I think you know absolutely what you're saying, and it, it goes back to uh, even all the way back to where people with lighter complexions are getting. Uh, I hate to say easier because of course mm -hmm. none of the tasks are easier, they're but they're today. right. They're doing mm -hmm. work in a house or as a seamstress mm -hmm. instead of being put into a field, and, mm -hmm. and it just carries that legacy forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I just have one. Um, you mentioned that you know you were any names enslaved mm -hmm. in the Owens family? Yeah. Were any names? Possibly they yes. Place so where they came from with that documented at any time. Sometimes. So um, I wish I had included an image of uh, the inside of the orientation gallery because one of the things in there is a big wall of names. Oh. So here's what we know. For the Richardsons, um, I know more about the folks he sold away than I do about the people in the house because oh, okay. uh, that's just how the documents. Hmm. turned out. Um, I know that in the Richardson house, uh, almost everybody enslaved there was a woman or girl, and hmm. most of them were fairly young. Oh, wow. um, it, it's not surprising to have a majority of women because most of the tasks in an urban environment hmm. are, are female dominated. Hmm. Um, for the Owens, we know a little more. Um, we often have names and ages for the Owens, Owen in, Owens inherited a lot of rural property, agricultural property, and people from his father, um, which means that that's often where those people came from. So sometimes you can trace them back to the different rural properties that they came from. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like given the documents that we have discovered, and you know you never get them all, right? right. Like, mm -hmm. there's more out there. Like I said, if, if I found 200 people, mm -hmm. then he shipped a whole lot more than 200 people right. out there. Right. Um, so I think there are still some things that could be found and some connections made. Um, but that's that's what we know at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, I work for the clerk's office down further in Central Florida. And um, I work in records management, so we deal with records dating back to like 18, maybe the earliest records are maybe 1834, something like that. And what I find is the only time the enslaved people are mentioned that they kept from year to year is when um, the slave owner is updating, say, his will, or so he's including all of his property, you know, everything that his, he owns, or for tax purposes, where they're they're just jotting down everything that they own, and I mean, they're going from furniture on the next line is a person's name, you know, black, female, age, worth, that sort of thing. So the only time the ones that are mentioned in the records that I see is, you know, when they're dealing with wills, tax purposes, something of that nature, estate matters, probate areas, things like that. Yeah. And then another thing I wanted to talk about was going back to when we were talking about the fair skin or fair skinned individuals and the darker skin. I think that the treatment came, the better treatment started off back where you were talking about because mulattoes came from slave owners. Right. Mm -hmm. And so part of their own selfishness was, I can't even, I have to treat my own better than just another slave mm -hmm. out there, an enslaved person. I got to treat them better because they, they still are of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still part of me. So I, I can't treat them like my own white people. You know, my family is white, but I do understand that this is my family too. I made them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still a part of this, my blood. And so that's where that better treatment, I believe that's where it started. And it's just kind of trickled down and then it's infiltrated in mm -hmm. amongst our own people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And we got to do that. <laughs> we got to do that all the way around. Yep. Out of some of those young, like she was just saying, did he father any? Did they have children with those kids? Because I know slave owners who they enslaved did have 
children with the some of the enslaved. Did that happen in this house? <laughs> we don't have any evidence that it did. Mm-hmm. But why would we? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I, that's a, it's a hard question. For the Owens family, we don't have any evidence that it did. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think the way... I have questions about the way they write about Emma and Harriet, her daughter, in their wills. And, like, not just make sure they're provided for, but, like, they have to stay in our family. And our, I have questions about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for Richardson, I, I, I feel like some nefarious things did happen. And, and, again, we have no evidence. But I do know that for Richardson, when he lived in the house, and he lived there a very short time, actually, about two and a half years, uh, it was him and his wife and their children, and their children were like little bit children. Mm-hmm. And then William J., the architect, lived there for a while. It was his brother-in-law. That's how the oh. connection was there. Um, another young man who uh, was Richardson's ward, so another young white man in his 20s, and then a couple of young white men who were apprenticed to Richardson in the shipping business. Mm-hmm. So you had five white men between 15 and 35, mm-hmm. um, and all of the people enslaved during that period were women, and most of them were young women. Mm-hmm. Um, so given given the way society functioned at that time, I would be fairly surprised if nothing ever happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not like people wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, everyone, for coming, and we hope to see you at next month's program. Thank you. Good. 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 Good.